I'm really delighted to be here with a colleague and dear friend of mine, Alec Ross, uh, author of the New York Times bestseller, Industries of the Future. Um, I would say you should go out and buy it, which you should, um, but all of you have free copies, which means go out and buy copies for all your friends and, and family. Um, it's really an extraordinary book. It, it, it covers everything from you know, robotics to genomics to uh, geopolitics to how to be a good parent. Um, and Alec has really done an incredible job traversing the globe, uh, trying to understand what the next wave of globalization looks like, um, really across a diverse array of sectors. Um, but before we, before we uh, sort of get into this, I want to share a little bit about Alec's background because uh, we've known each other for, for quite some time. We've gotten in some mischief together. Uh, we've been in and out of trouble over the course of the last decade. Um, we had a chance to work together for Secretary of State uh, Hillary Clinton, um, possibly soon to be President Clinton, the second one. Um, and Alec was uh, Hillary's first ever senior advisor for innovation. Uh, and it was a position that she created for him. And what was more amazing about it is Alec had run uh, tech policy and innovation for the Obama 08 campaign and was the sole Obama person who managed to land in the State Department. I think we all remember that uh, sort of tension that existed between the Hillary Clinton camp and the Obama camp. And he made innovation a part of American foreign policy in a way that really didn't exist before. Um, so I want to start by thanking you for your service to the country, um, but also thank you for joining us today. Um, this book is as much about the industries of the future uh, as it is an individual sitting next to me who has spent his entire life trying to answer a fundamental question about what's happening next. And I want to start with the first sentence of the book, which is, it's 3 a.m. and I'm mopping up whiskey-smelling puke after a country music concert in Charleston, West Virginia. And this is a book about industries of the future. So take us from mopping up puke in West Virginia to the person who ended up writing a book about what the next wave of globalization looks like. Well, thank you, Jared, for that introduction. And thank you all for, for coming out this afternoon. So it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm mopping up whiskey smell and puke after a country music concert in Charleston, West Virginia. Why was I doing that? Uh, well, look, when I was in college, you know, having grown up a public school kid in West Virginia, while most of my classmates in my fancy college were off doing unpaid internships at investment banks or law firms or tech companies or their parents had gotten them apartments in Washington, D.C. so they could be interns in Congress, I had to actually make money during uh, when I was in college. And so what that meant for me going home was the jobs that I had were working on a beer truck and working as a midnight janitor. Uh, and so growing up in West Virginia, I thought that my reality was like everybody's reality, which is from an economic standpoint, what you're actually trying to do is just manage decline as best you can. And so it wasn't until I left West Virginia and I entered the work world and I was sort of very blessed and privileged to get to spend a couple decades as an entrepreneur, in politics, in government, as an author, you know, until I fully understood that globalization was not about managing dissent. Uh, the point, in fact, globalization was overwhelmingly positive. But in the community that I grew up in, it was not entirely positive. And so the, the process of writing the book, the reason why I open up with that story is I try to give a balanced perspective on my, on, the, on a view into the future. Most people who write books about the future write either utopian books or dystopian books. It's either, oh, we're gonna live to be 150 years old, happy, healthy, wealthy, wanting for nothing, nothing but abundance, or it's written from the fetal position, sort of eyes closed, fists clenched, and you know, usually shaking a fist at you guys. Uh, and, but I think the reality is much more sort of up the middle. And, and net optimistic, I think that tomorrow will be better than today. But in examining the industries of the future, it was, poor, it was important for me from the very outset to do some framing just so that um, it would be understood that it was viewed through the eyes of a public school kid from West Virginia who put himself through college by working as a midnight janitor as opposed to from a position of sort of lifelong privilege. 
Um, so I want to ask you one question about your, your time at the State Department. Before I do that, Sam's giving me a look because I realized I forgot to introduce myself. Um, Jared Cohen, president of Jigsaw at Alphabet and advisor to Eric Schmidt as well. Um, I hope they all know who you are. I'm happy to speak at great length about who you are. No, no, let's, go, let's, let's, let's go back to you. Um, so you went to the State Department. You had never met Hillary Clinton before you started working for her. Is that, is that correct? I had, I had actually met her before. Okay. What, the, what was the context? Well, the context was my social enterprise had done some work in partnership with her office, but we were not close. Right, and she's a politician. They right. never remember anything. She, yeah, yeah, right. She so, shakes lots of hands. Um, so what is the first conversation about innovation with her look like? She's just lost an election. Uh, it looked like she was sort of headed to retirement. She gets resurrected as Secretary of State, and then you sort of appear, and you have a conversation about innovation. What, what, what does that look like? It's a fairly remarkable conversation. I mean, I was on the presidential transition team, and I was busy trying to figure out which fancy job I was going to take, you know, the White House, or chief of staff of this, or doing that. And I was sort of summoned to see Hillary Clinton. And I was like, why does she want to see me? Does she want to like yell at me? Uh, because I run technology and media policy for the campaign to beat her. And she sort of sat me down and she said, Alec, I thought I was going to be president. And she said, I have lots of very capable people uh, who I know and like who are going to fill up the executive rights of the politically appointed offices across the federal government. She's like, now I need to fit them all into one department, into the State Department. She goes, but I need to make one exception. She goes, I need one of you internet people. <laughs> one of you innovation people. And she, what she said, she said, I think the promise and peril of the 21st century is no longer contained by vast distances or, natural, or, or national borders. And I think the internet is gonna be a big part of that. Now I should say at this point that I did not set up her emails. So, you know, <laughs> I, did, I did not, so for those of you in this room, I would think that most of you could probably set up homebrewed servers and basements, but for those few of you who work at Google who can't, if you are here at this session to learn out how to do, learn how to do that, this is the wrong session, that was another guy. Um, who just got immunity. He did just get immunity. He actually applied to me for a job and actually didn't get a job. <laughs> but we'll leave that aside. Uh, so, you know, but, the, but the point being is that she recognized early she saw in her own campaign how the internet was something that significantly impacted her campaign for the worst. She ran a good 20th century campaign. Uh, Senator Obama ran a good 21st century campaign. And so her theory in becoming Secretary of State was that information networks would, would impact the conduct of diplomacy. And it proved to be right for better, for worse, from you know, WikiLeaks on you know, what was thought at the time to be the negative side, to programs we built on the positive side. So basically, her theory, which Jared and I, um, and a woman named Anne Marie Slaughter then built out some intellectual architecture below, was that the internet would change the traditional relationships in diplomacy beyond the formal ar architecture of 196 sovereign nation states. And it's worth adding, if this was not, if we actually reflect back, this was not so obvious back then. To all of you, it would have been obvious, but to the sort of stodgy halls of, of, of government, you know, back then you more or less got laughed out of the room for talking about the internet or technology in any public sector context that wasn't the FCC. Um, let's, turn to your, let's turn to your book. Um, one of the things that's interesting uh, about your book is you, you, you move beyond this sort of jargon of today where people talk so much about you know, AI and disruption and innovation and machine learning that these words and terms, have, are, they're, they're so used and overused in context, out of context. I don't know what they mean <laughs> they, 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 Essentially, they've lost their, their, their meaning. You argue in the book that globalization is an ongoing process. It never finishes. And you spend a lot of time focusing less on the jargon of today and where this is all going. What is the next wave of globalization that excites you and where are we today in the process? So the next wave of globalization that most excites me is, to, oh, I think that a substantial number of today's frontier markets will become tomorrow's developing markets and a substantial number of today's developing markets will be tomorrow's developed markets. So the real story, if you just sort of do the math, the, the great story of globalization in the last 25 years is the story of India and China. Nearly a billion 
billion with a B. Nearly a billion people migrated out of poverty into the working and middle classes in, from China and India. And so I think that that is really sort of the big story of the last stage of globalization. What I think that it will be the story of the next stage of globalization are markets that we think of as largely inaccessible suddenly becoming accessible. And I think that this is gonna be a byproduct in part of the combination of hardware and software innovation. And so if I could, if I could take just sort of a, a minute or two to describe one of this weirder predictions of mine from the book, but which I, God's honest truth, I believe is gonna be true. So right now there are some very difficult to access markets like Papua New Guinea uh, and <coughs> Indonesia. And Jared, I hope you and I travel to Papua New Guinea. I would love to. Yes, before it gets overrun by you know, guys in white shirts and red ties. Um, Papua New Guinea is, is largely inaccessible for most businesses right now because they speak over 800 languages. Uh, it might seem, that might seem like a ridiculous reason for barrier to entry, but it's actually why people have a very hard time doing business there. Similarly, Indonesia. There are enough people in Jakarta and Bali who speak uh, English or French that you can do business in Jakarta and Bali, but there are over 1,100 islands and over 700 other languages spoken. So the vast majority of Indonesia, for example, is largely inaccessible. And so what I believe is that there will be a device that if you travel to Papua New Guinea and somebody is speaking one of those 800 uh, languages, there will be an earpiece that you can put in your ear. And as someone is speaking to you in whatever language, at the speed of sound, uh, the voice that you hear in your ear will be the language that you want to hear. And it won't be Siri's voice. It will measure the free frequency, wavelength, and sound intensity. <coughs> Uh, and other properties of the voice and translate the voice that you are hearing in your ear to that with very closely approximating the speaker. And so I think that that kind of thing, like literally being able to pop something in your ear and be able to speak to anybody in any language um, is gonna do more to, to unleash the next wave of globalization than anything else. Uh, on, on the device thing, I, I can't resist the, the, the urge to ask, if, if, there's a, if there's a friend of mine that I think has a particularly soothing voice, or sort of an endearing voice, can I have that voice, or do I, am I sort of stuck with some version of my own? So for those of you who don't know Jared, this is a characteristically Jared question. Of course, Jared. Did you do your mother-in-law? I'm no? sure you can do, you know, an Australian accent. You know, and can you can you combine them? Can I do sort of, you know, Australian accent on Tuesday, mother-in-law on Thursday, best friend on, on Friday? You know, I don't. This, given the product hasn't actually been invented yet, when when I invent it. Um, I'll be sure to keep these design features in mind. And it's, it, it is fun to speculate about the future. The, the, the best part is, if you're right, everyone thinks you're a genius. If you speculate far enough into the future and you're wrong, nobody remembers, nobody remembers. and you can sort of deny it. Well, I did in this book, I tried to keep things bounded 20 years at the outermost limit. Um, because beyond that, it's just sort of getting, it gets a little silly. And I also think that things are gonna change rather substantially over the, last, over the next 20 years. So I wanna ask you a little bit about, about norms, because obviously this group understands technology uh, very well, probably better than, than any other groups that, that you've spoken to while you've been on, on, on book tour. Um, but norms matter a lot, and you, you have a really interesting couple chapters where you touch on robotics. And one of the things you observe is, it seems that in the US, the notion of robotics is scary to the general populace and evokes images of Terminator, and maybe that's because Terminator 2 was a very popular American movie, um, but then you go to Japan and you spend time with robotics companies there, um, and it's wildly embraced. Talk about the, you know, what is it about you know, culture in Japan and elsewhere that leads people to have a totally different interpretation of what is in fact the same technology. Yeah, so it's really interesting. So in Western societies, Western religions, we are, our mythology, uh, our culture sort of tells us, reinforces the idea that we ought to guard against animating, bringing to life that uh, which perhaps we ought not. So from Icarus's waxed wings to Frankenstein, uh, you know, we are sort of, we are continually warned in our mythology, in our culture, in our fiction against such things. By contrast, uh, in Japan, for example, 80% of Japanese people practice Shinto. 
uh, the religion of Shinto. And Shinto, believe, they believe in animism, which holds that objects like humans have souls. And so one of the, one of the I think, quite interesting uh, innovations that I described as happening right now is the move towards elder care robots in Japan. How, how many of you have heard of, raise, raise your hand, how many of you have heard of elder care robots in Japan? Like the highest penetration in any audience of people that have heard of that. I was about that. to say, that's a bananas. Um, I must see Google. Uh, for the 40% for the of you who have not heard of this, I mean, Japan has the world's longest living citizens that, you know, I think it's 83 for women, 79 for men and they are growing older because of relatively uh, restrictive immigration policies and low birth rates, there are not enough grandchildren to take care of grandparents. And so Honda and Toyota, yes, the automakers, as well as some startups are looking at literally creating home, uh, they are creating home care robots, which do everything from lift the grandparents out of bed to entertain them with, entertaining them with violin playing and other such things. But what's interesting to me is the degree to which uh, culture is deterministic uh, in terms of the creation of these robots and the, the degree to which people are and are not comfortable with the technology. And so I think that this is going to affect, when you look at sort of the 196 country chessboard, if you think of robotics as being one of those industries that is consequential today but which will be substantially more consequential tomorrow, I think a lot of it is going to come from East Asian societies, in part because they don't have the cultural baggage that we do in the West. So I think you know when you when you talk, I want to, I want to stay on this theme of norms because I think it's something that that we at you know Google and Alphabet more broadly could probably you know spend a little bit more time thinking about. And you know differences, you know nuanced differences between you know robotics evoking fears of Terminator, you know in the West and you know being wildly embraced in the East. It, that, that's subtle compared to some of the more complex normative challenges. So one of the things you talk a lot about in your book is the commercialization of genomics and life sciences more broadly. Um, when we talk about these things, we talk as if there's one jurisdiction on Earth, um, and it makes all the ethical conversations and debates that we have um, you know, sort of miss the larger point, which is there's 196 different jurisdictions on Earth, and they range from North Korea to the United States and everything in between. So, you know, you have a situation where countries have different sets of values and ethics and ambitions and aspirations. And so, let's take a very controversial debate that we're all familiar with, which is, you know, the process of, of, of editing genes uh, to sort of improve an unborn child. Um, you know, there's lots of regulations in the United States, for instance, that will protect against the productization of babies. Uh, but what happens when some entrepreneur decides, okay, I can't do this in China, but Qatar will let me build a multi-billion dollar company that does gene editing to get the right eye color, or gene editing to get the right height. How do you handle that kind of ethical asymmetry um, and you know, who ends up winning in that situation? Is it the jurisdictions that have the right ethical standards, if you can even sort of you know, answer the question of who's right, or is it the jurisdictions that have a very lax and irresponsible attitude about this? Yeah, so, so let's unpack that a little bit. So for context, the norms that exist in terms of governance on the internet exist dating back to a period when nobody was really paying attention. So, you know, I'm sure most of this audience is familiar with the multi-stakeholder model for internet governance that is inclusive of the private sector, government, academia, civil society, and it's international, though the United States has a pretty heavy thumb on the scale on policy issues of consequence. To be able to create the governance model, which in turn dominates the norm setting for the internet, uh, it would be impossible to reconstitute that today. Um, they were only able to do it at the time because there was insufficient attention given to the issue and there was remarkable asymmetry in terms of capability where the capabilities were largely domiciled in the United States. So the United States got to dominate the process for establishing governance of the internet and the subsequent norm setting. Now I think that for the industries of the future, and let's stick to the commercialization of genomics, which you brought up, uh, every, everybody has two eyes open. And so the idea that 
the rules and regulations that are set in the United States and the norms, you know, that which is considered to be acceptable or unacceptable independent of regulation and statute, the idea that our country, uh, which constitutes five, fewer than 5% of the globe's population, um, is going to be able to dictate what the 95% of the rest of the world thinks, does, and accepts is naive. Um, especially since there are other states out there, like China, for example, um, which are very, which are investing very, very aggressively in the space, so that they can be the headquarters to the Googles of the gen of genomics. The world's last trillion dollar industry was created out of computer code. The world's next trillion dollar industry is going to be created out of genetic code, and it is an open question where the HQs will be for the trillion dollar industry of the future. And so getting back to this question of, of norms, what I believe is going to happen is that if the United States significantly regulates uh, what can and cannot be done with gene editing, then we will see in the same way in which uh, Switzerland created sort of a permissionless environment uh, for decades in, in banking, I think that we will see the equivalent of what, what Switzerland was to banking will be, you said Qatar, will be any of 10 or 12 states around the globe for genomics. So that an expectant mother uh, who is you know, newly in her second trimester, who has seen that you know, there is a mutation in a, a specific a specific protein is misfiring uh, on a gene, a gene and she wants it fixed, but it countervails the laws in the United States, then she'll get on a plane and she will fly to whatever country does allow it. And so what I think is, is interesting is that I do think that ultimately these countries will set, these companies that are commercializing genomics will set up in the most, uh, in the most lax environment. From a regulatory standpoint, we already see within the life sciences lots of companies um, moving their headquarters abroad for tax purposes. So there's, are, bluntly, there's already a culture within the field of saying, you know what, we don't have to be an American company. Um, and then, as we all know, you know, they can create corporate vehicles even if they do have most of their employees in the United States. They'll create you know, different corporate vehicles and structures to allow them to end up doing whatever they want abroad. So I, I think that government actually has significantly limited power to curtail innovation and productization in this space, norms be damned, because somebody somewhere will create an environment that allows people to do whatever you want. And what's the, what's the regulatory reaction to that, right? So, you know, it, you know you have a bunch of companies out there that you know are difficult to regulate because, and, and maybe they're doing something disruptive, but they're difficult to regulate because of the jurisdictions that they're headquartered in. Um, is there a risk that the companies that are doing it right, that are operating in you know, uh, you know stricter jurisdictions, end up getting the sort of wrath of government because they can be scrutinized, whereas some of the others can't? I mean, so yes, but let's also back up a little bit. Let's back up and let's actually ask the question, you know, should parents be able to gene edit so that instead of having a son who's projected to be between five foot five and five foot seven, they want to add inches. They want him to be between six foot two and six foot four. They want to not just repair damaged DNA, but they want to make what they consider to be enhancements. I you, look, I could argue that both ways. I really could. Um, you know, what constitutes an enhancement? What do we allow? What do we disallow? Do we allow eye color to be changed? Do we allow height and height to be changed? Do we allow weight to be projected? Weight to be changed if there if there is a genetic indicator that that um, indicates that the child will likely be obese. I mean, there's so much subjectivity baked into this then I actually think we need to ask the second, third, and fourth question here and not be a solution in search of a problem. Um, so while my wife and I might make choices to not gene edit 
a child in utero, I'm not yet ready to concede the point that um, anything, uh, anything beyond um, addressing what we know to be uh, malignancies in our genetic profile is necessarily a bad thing. I tend to be in favor of more freedom than less freedom. So speaking of less freedom, let's talk about China for a minute. Because um, you mentioned it, you mentioned it before. So um, you know, China, in many respects, is a fascinating case study for a lot of uh, the, the, the things that you mentioned in the book and, and, and how they'll play out. Let me ask you just let me ask you two different China questions. One about innovation. One about the increased complexity of, of geopolitics, and then maybe a leadership question. And I'll open it up to the to the audience. Um, so when I look at China. Um, they are competing in two capitalist systems. They compete in one capitalist system uh, that allows them to innovate by stealing intellectual property and then scaling copied companies on the foundation of that stolen intellectual property. Um, and then they also compete in the same capitalist system that the United States is part of, which is basically legitimate innovation. And they're able to do both, right? There's a lot of legitimate innovation in China, you know, and then of course there's some stolen intellectual property. So there's an asymmetry here, and in a world where China can play in two systems and innovate in ways that um, you know countries that abide by different sets of norms and laws can, it doesn't seem to me like a fair fight. So how does that play out in terms of the sort of competition over building the next innovative multi-billion dollar company? Yeah, so this is gonna be terribly undiplomatic, but I'm not a diplomat anymore, so I don't care. Um, <laughs> I actually would, would argue against, I mean, what innovation com has come from China that's rooted in the internet? Not a lot. I mean, I, I, you know, you'd be hard pressed, and most of it is derivative, it's a little tweak here, it's a little tweak there. I actually think that um, the overwhelming, I, I think that, you know, overwhelmingly, China has built big internet businesses because it has stolen intellectual property from abroad. You know, when I was in government, we declassified a national intelligence estimate report, which we rarely did, um, which pegged the annual intellectual property theft, theft about $300 billion a year. I mean, if you go into the source code of Renren, Ren, it says a Mark Zuckerberg production on it, literally, um, because Mark did a vanity thing, you know, in the source code for Facebook, and you know, they stole it, and we literally saw it in, in Renren. Ren. It's hilarious. Um, so, you know, I actually think that you know, while they have built some good internet-based businesses, I think they're largely a product of theft and mercantilism. Um, and so the question now is the industries of the future. You know, will they be able to innovate in fields like the commercialization of genomics, big data, cybersecurity, and other such fields? And I think the answer is yes and no. I think that there will be fields where they cr create things, where imagination and invention turns to commercialization and they build legitimate businesses. I think there, that there will be fields where they do that. Um, I think that the commercialization of genomics is likely to be an especially good place for them. You know, BGI, what was formerly called the Beijing Genomics Institute, is now actually the largest, uh, does more gene sequencing than any place on planet Earth. And in genomics, for example, unlike the internet, where they built their internet-based businesses being content from the outset, uh, to wall off their population of 1.3 billion people. So long as they could dominate China, they didn't mind that they were not largely exporting. And it was really Jack Ma and Alibaba who sort of first asserted uh, that Chinese companies can and should export. I mean, it was Alibaba on the consumer-facing side. Um, it was Huawei on the enterprise side. Uh, and now we see with Xiaomi and others, they are growing more assertive. Uh, what I do think is that for the industries of the future, I don't think that they're going to be content to view their own home market as an end done to itself initially. And I think they're, they're going to be more inherently global. And as a result of that, I actually think that they will be more rights respecting. Uh, in the commercialization of genomics, for example, I would be very surprised if BGI or any of the other large institutions get into the pattern of IP theft and state-supported IP theft that their internet-based businesses uh, did. And I think that that is largely because if they position themselves in the marketplace like that, then 
they will have a very difficult time doing the necessary partnering and other exercises it will take to eventually become the deca billion dollar company hq in china so as much as i've as i've sort of bashed china on you know their practices in the internet space and you know full disclosure my name was a banned search term on the internet in china for two years um, and i spent 100 million dollars of taxpayer dollars uh, on different technologies to allow people to get around government firewalls, most of which you probably use. Um, I actually I think that would get your name banned. Well, yeah, right. you know, that, would, that would do it. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that I take a, a more optimistic view of the future, because I do think that the entrepreneurs in China are thinking globally now, as opposed to locally, the way that their internet-based businesses did beginning in the late 90s until three, four, five years ago. And there's also, we've talked about this before, there's also, a, a, especially with a younger generation of entrepreneurs, there's a badge of honor associated with being able to say they did it legitimately. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you a geopolitical question about China, then one quick one on leadership slash parenting, and then we'll, we'll open it up. Um, the, we, one of the things you talk about is uh, you know, the sort of impact that all of this innovation industries of the future will have on just the sort of international dynamics uh, that we see play out in geopolitics. So, you know, last time I checked, there's one international system, right? It has a physical front, it has a digital front. Um, yet when you look at uh, the foreign policies of states, their policies in one domain at times will contradict the other. So let me give an example in the context of US and China. What is the relationship between the United States and China? Well, in the physical domain, at, at worst, it's frenemies, at best, it's partners. In the digital domain, the two countries are in a perpetual state of war, and the relationship is more kinetic and adversarial than the physical one between the United States and North Korea. So the problem I have is these are still only two countries. Their foreign policies contradict each other um, across the two domains. So is there a point at which nefarious cyber activity spills over and potentially fuels a physical world of conflict? Yes, so this is, it, it, you know, we were talking earlier about n norm setting. What's interesting about the cyber domain is there essentially are no there are no norms that have been set. There are no there are very few things in the ways of treaties. There are very few multilateral institutions that are functional. You know, it's not like uh, the frameworks that were built in the 50s through 80s around nuclear arms, which were which uh, we were able to forge agreements with the USSR. Uh, in large part because of mutual interest. Right now, the United States and China, for example, have such a different set of values around what is and is not permissive on, in the internet space. So the United States, for example, we will not give any ground on, um, and we will not be party to any treaty that curtails our ability to engage in, in um, intelligence activities. We won't, we won't be a signatory to any of that. And because we won't be a signatory to any of that, which is a sort of a precondition for the Chinese to engage with us on anything, the Chinese will not be a signatory to anything meaningful uh, that curtails their work in, in economic espionage, IP theft. And so what you get is, you know, in the Venn diagram, there's very little overlap in space. And the, what happens is we end up having a very different relationship in the internet space, in the cyber domain, than we do in, in the physical world and sort of the polite world. What I will say though is we're talking about governments. What would actually be interesting to me is the relationship, not just country to country, but country to company. So I remember, for example, when Google was cyber attacked in 2010, I think it was. Um, I think it was 2000, maybe it was the end of 2009, 2009. And your then CEO, Eric Schmidt, picked up the phone and called us and described to us what had happened. Google was one of 35 large enterprises, you know, like Raytheon, Boeing, and others, that had been significantly cyber attacked by the Chinese. And so what was interesting to me is these companies were large and well-established companies that after being cyber attacked, what they did is they picked up the phone and they called Washington. Um, but I imagine, like, what if it was, instead of Eric Schmidt, uh, CEO of Google, what if it was a 28-year-old who, who had absolutely no interest in what Washington thought about any of this, and after being attacked, and after, say, identifying the point of attack coming from Unit 63198, 
of the People's Liberation Army of China, and you were able to identify the very specific facilities in the Pudong district of Shanghai that was the point of origin of the attack. Instead of picking up the phone and calling Washington, what if they said, let's take them out? And so what's really interesting it, to me is the idea that the conflict doesn't just have to be country to country, it could actually be country to company, um, and company to country. Uh, and so like Sony, for example, after Sony was attacked, now Sony has absolutely no cyber chops, so they could not have you know, fought back against the North Koreans, but what if they did? And what if instead of, you know, after having been hacked, what if they had said, you know what, we're now gonna go after them? to the maximum extent possible. So I also think that companies play an increasingly consequential role in all this way. And of course, not every private sector is the same, right? You have, you know, in this country, you have the private sector is distinct from the public sector. Um, in some countries, it's an arm of the state. In other countries, it's a mixture of the two and, and, and more complex. All right, last question before we, we open it up, and we'll, we'll be brief on this, but I think it's relevant to everyone here. As somebody who's you know, worked at the highest level in the, in, in the public sector, who's studied all the industries that are gonna fundamentally alter our world, you, know, you look out at the audience here and you have the most brilliant minds, in my opinion, in the, in the entire world. You know, the people that are actually building the things that are gonna shape our future, you know, present um, and, and going forward. Um, there's also an activist spirit that we have at, the, at this company. Um, so what is the role of a Google employee, for instance, going forward? You know, how, how should we all, beyond the sort of day jobs that we have, how should we be thinking about our contributions to the industries of the future? That's really interesting. That's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I'd say first, I'm really glad that Google is doing things like actually, like establishing a company called Jigsaw uh, to actually be able to organize its activities in this space. You know, so I think that that's, that's a, a great first step that many companies are not, are, are not taking, um, in part because they don't have the capabilities that you do. I mean, the, the other thing that I would, I would say two other things. I would say, first of all, uh, you know, don't rule out the possibility of going to work in government at some point. You know, government, there are aspects of, the play, of, the, of government that would infuriate you, but you get to work on incredibly consequential stuff. Um, and, you know, there are certain things that you simply can't do as Google employees that you will not be, you know, you cannot wipe out GPS in Syria to keep, to prevent surgical political assassinations because, because of the collaboration between Syria, telling the Syrian intelligence. Maybe Lali well, like, can. Yeah. Well, you know, but if he did, he was, he'd be breaking the law, um, actually in our country. But, you know, so I actually would not, would not, I would actually, encourage you all to think about public service. For those of you that are happy with your lives at Google, and I think certainly just walking around here, you ought to be. Um, the other thing that I would say is, is you know, think about with your 20% time, as well as you know, with your life outside of work, how you can take the skills that you have uh, and put it to work on you know, those, those public policy issues that you care about. You know, there is a huge amount of asymmetry between civil society and say this room full of employees at, at Google. In civil society, nonprofits, for example, thirst uh, for the kind of skills that you have that they simply can't hire. Uh, so to the extent that you can use whatever time you have here as well as outside of, outside of work to meaningfully contribute to public policy issues, I think you're gonna find it, you know, quite rewarding. Let's take some uh, questions. Just kind of wave your hand and, or no, sorry, there's microphones here. Um, it, you can test your vocal chops and scream or you can go up to the microphone. I think you're supposed to go to the microphone because of the video. I see you nodding. And just introduce yourself as well. Hi, my name. You're good. Are you here? Okay, hey, hi, you need to turn on the thing. Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Donnie Reber. Um I'm new here. I, um, I'm just wondering, uh, I think that uh, a lot of what you were talking about uh, in terms of like the last 50 years is kind of a story of global homogeneity. Just things becoming, rights and norms becoming more homogenous as people sort of barriers break down, people have exposure to ideals that they might not have heard before. Um, and then you talk about genomics and you talk about how countries are gonna have very different perspectives on what's allowed. Do you think that the, going forward the story becomes more heterogeneous as people build up walls to support their positions? with respect to what's okay ethically, or do you think it becomes more homogenous as sort of like the barrier, the, the sort of the force of the people pushes down those walls? Thank you. 
Yeah, so I think that there are two things that are going to happen. Let's go back to Papua New Guinea. So I think that uh, I think that as frontier economies are brought into the economic mainstream and into global markets, what we will see is a product it is a process of homogenization, which is not to say that Papua New Guinea is suddenly going to look like South Korea. It's not. Um, but what you are going to see is it is going to it is going to be it is going to tilt toward homo homogeneity. The question about heterogeneity is really one about, and for me, it's one about competition. You know, are there, you know, is it going to be a Chinese set of norms, an American set of norms, a European set of norms, something else? Uh, and so here, you know, I think that I, I think that we are going to see more fragmentation, but I don't know that I would call it walling off. I see it as, I, I, I'd rather see it as, as competition and largely a competition for wealth uh, and you know, geopolitical and geoeconomic dominance. So when a state or society is making a choice about the degree to which it's going to be open or closed, permissive or restrictive, or other such things, at the end of the day, what they're trying to maximize for are one of two things, geopolitical power or geoeconomic power. And you know how that makes it distinct or heterogeneous to you, use your word, or looking more like what exists across the ocean, homogeneous. I think will be also a, a question and part of, of um, the entrepreneurial models, which are not necessarily going to be rooted in state. So in one of the there's a chapter in the book called the geography of future markets, and and one of the things that I posit is that. You know, as much of the trillions of dollars of wealth creation that took place, that's taken place over the last 25 years with the internet, has flowed through a 30 mile wide, 30 mile long, 15 mile wide area of California called Silicon Valley. I think that Silicon Valley will remain strong, maybe even strong guest in the next wave of innovation. But what I do posit is that there will probably be between 12 and 15 global foci, sort of 12 to 15 other places around the world which will be significant centers of innovation and wealth creation. But where they are will be, I think it'll be interesting, they won't necessarily be defined by the national character. Uh, they will be certainly be influenced by it. But you know, when you think about cities like Dubai, or Cape Town, or Shanghai, or Seoul, or Sao Paulo, certainly they're products and part of the nation state, but they're also something fairly distinct unto themselves. And you know, in my own travels, what I've come to understand is I'm much more likely to see one of my peers in any one of those cities than I am to see them in like my native West Virginia or something like that. And so I do think that as much as the character of the nation state will inform uh, how things look, I also think that there is an entrepreneurial class that moves around the globe, that congregates in certain kinds of places and will create businesses there that doesn't necessarily comport entirely with the national character. Other questions? Thank you, very much. Hello, uh, I'm Dan. So uh, you've spoken very compellingly about winners, industries that are emerging, uh, but in the spirit of President Trump, can you talk a little bit about losers? <laughs> sort of <laughs> industries. Are, uh, you know, what are the industries of the past that we may not expect? to diminish. Yeah. Um. We almost made it the full hour without talking about Donald Trump. Vulgar, <laughs> <laughs> demented Donald Trump. Um, yeah, we're all in trouble if he becomes fragile. Um, so so when, when I think about winners and losers, you know, the binary I think of, I think that I think the principal political and economic binary of the 20th century was left versus right. I think the dominant political and economic binary of the 21st century is open versus closed. Um, and by open, what do I mean? I mean, uh, is, upward and, is upward social and economic m mobility confined to elites? Or can public school kids from West Virginia sort of make their way upward? Are cultural and religious norms uh, dictated from on high? Are, is it a rights-respecting country? Uh, religious, ethnic, sexual minorities, are women fully empowered in the economy? So, and, and recognizing that there are no perfectly open or closed societies, the closest to either might be North Korea, uh, 
being closest to a closed society, I think that that, w that which is gonna most determine who the winners are and who the losers are is I think that the most open societies will be those that are most competitive in the industries of the future. Because going back to my previous point about sort of the class of entrepreneurs and innovators, I say them increasingly want to congregate and create businesses and live and work in the most open societies possible. Um, I also think that these are the places where capital flows the most freely. You know, where somebody who dropped out of college can get a significant seed round and take their idea and try to create a product out of it. I think it is the kind of place where crazy ideas, and usually a big business starts with a crazy idea, where a crazy idea actually gets uh, a good chance. So, you know, not thinking so much about industries uh, that will be the, the quote unquote losers in the future, but where, when I think about the places, uh, it will be those, pl those places that are most closed. Um, much more so than during the last wave of globalization where the quote unquote losers were, were largely determined by you know, one of two factors. What are your relative labor costs? And um, you know, to what degree did you adapt your economy from being industrial to knowledge based? Other questions? While we're waiting, I have another question. Do you have one? Yeah. Okay. And don't forget to introduce yourself. My name is Yura, and I am very interested in what you mentioned about robotics. So I wonder what you exactly see in Japan about the home care robotics, and what is actually the customer reaction to it, and also what you think about industrial robotics, and this, do you see difference between U.S. and the thing that actually happening in Japan or Asia countries? Yep. So let me let me back up a little bit and say that. You know, I think that the robots of the cartoons and movies of the 1970s are gonna be the reality of the 2020s. Um, and I think that's largely gonna be because of two things. First of all, mapping belief space. You know, the mathematical breakthroughs that have allowed us to take, you know, historically difficult robotic tasks like grasping and make them more programmable and taking robots from being dominantly two-dimensional beings to three-dimensional beings. That and cloud robotics. So this is fundamentally changing the economics of robotics. So like, let's think about one of the movies of the 1970s. Let's think about, let's was think anyone, about- Was anyone here alive in the 1970s? Yeah, right. All right. They watched the movies yeah. from the 1970s, Jared. So let's think about C-3PO. You know, if C-3PO walked in here right now and interrupted us, uh, he would say, oh dear, oh my, and, <laughs> and go find your, and go find an open seat right now. Uh, so what would be happening? So what would be happening if you think about, you know, the cognition necessary for C-3PO to recognize that he had interrupted a lecture? The, se the um, speaking, excusing himself, the sensory ability to identify an open seat and the mobility then, to then be able to go take a seat. As a practical matter, we know that the amount of hot hardware and software whirring and that gold gleaming body would be consequential. Right? With cloud robotics, C3PO will be a cloud connected device. So, you know, as he walks in and interrupts us, he'll ping the cloud. And what the impact of this is, is one of principally of economics. So, I'm sure you're all familiar with Foxconn. Uh, Terry Gu, the CEO of Foxconn, explained the economics of robotics to me. He said, humans are all, are all, are, are little capex, all opex and robots are all capex, no opex. You know, when you, hire a, when you hire a human being, you know, maybe you get a phone or a computer, or business cards, not very much, but every two weeks you wanna get paid. So very little upfront costs, lots of opex. Uh, by contrast, with robots, you have to buy the robot, you have to buy the expensive robot. But once you do, you can work them for 24 hours, you know, you don't have to pay him a salary, he's not gonna get sick, He's not going to unionize, so very little opex. And so what's interesting with cloud, cloud robotics is we're seeing new equilibrium points in the trade-off be, between whether it's worth uh, hiring a human or buying a robot. And to your question about uh, the home care robots in Japan, what we're seeing because of these two things, mapping, mapping belief space and cloud robotics, 
we're seeing robots being able to act in the home with a level of sophistication that was largely unimaginable just three years ago. And so this has facilitated their entry into the home. And even though it's not being done on a very significant scale yet, it's, it's largely being accepted. And I think it's largely being accepted in part because those who are actually allowing for ro elder care robots to be brought into their home are doing so voluntarily, right? It's not being imposed on them. They're sort of the early adopters. Uh, and also because, again, going back to cultural norms, you know, there isn't the cultural headwind that says, you know, you really shouldn't let your grandmother be picked up out of bed by a robot. On the question of how this relates to industrial robots, you know, here too, it's really interesting. Um, they're sort of, out of the 196 countries on planet Earth, there are basically only five that matter in robot production, uh, both consumer and industrial robot production. The United States, Germany, Japan, uh, South Korea, and China. Those five countries are the only ones that matter. You know, South Korea, a country of 50 million people, produces more industrial robots than the three billion people that live in India, Russia, Africa, South America, Central America combined. Uh, and the industrial, what, what's interesting with industrial robotics is the move here is it's taking robotic labor and automation from doing work that is merely manual and routine to cognitive and non-routine. So if you think about it, the industrial robots of the past, it largely displaced the work of men with big strong shoulders working in ports, factories, mills, and mines. You know, move object A to object B. Uh, you know, an industrial robot can, can move bigger objects, do it more reliably, and with less, with less liability. So what's interesting now is, again, because of AI, with industrial robots, robots being able to do things with more cognition and being able to do tasks that are not routine uh, we're seeing new forms of labor displacement and we're seeing uh, new kinds of industrial processes that I think are really interesting. And it's, the vast majority of it is coming from South Korea and Japan right now. Other questions? Uh. Hi, uh, I'm Andrew. Um, you mentioned labor displacement there at the end. Uh, and there, you know, you talk about these dystopian and utopian futures, and you also mentioned that you don't look more than 20 years ahead, or else it just gets silly. Um, do we see a basic income being required in the next 20 years, or is that still too silly to consider? Yeah, no, I don't think it's too. I don't think it's too silly. Too silly to consider. What's interesting is I'm now asked about a universal basic income in pretty much every book talk I do. But, if I, but this is a product of the last six months. Like if I had done this six months ago, I might have gotten one question about it. So this is something that I think there is an increasing public recognition around this issue of labor displacement. Uh, well, first of all, we ought to recognize that lots of countries are already doing this. You know, lots of places, you know, we know the example of Scandinavian countries, but I think that there will be other places with especially high per capita GDPs, which can basically create welfare systems. Um, without being too big a drag on the economy. The problem in the United States, over the, why I don't see it happening over the next 10 years, is because a universal basic income would be a massive entitlement program. And, you know, as long as we are running the kinds of budget deficits that we are, it's not realistic. You know, we would have to fundamentally change programs like Medicare, Medicaid, or our defense spending to be able to afford a UBI, a universal basic income. The other thing that makes me think that the United States is not gonna be ready for it in the next 10 years is because if you look at the last entitlement program that was just expanded, Obamacare, I mean, you would have thought we'd like burn the country down, you know, the kind of reaction that it got. And the establishment of a universal basic income would be far bigger than Obamacare. Um, and, and I, the, the last thing that I think presents a real headwind for the idea of the establishment of a universal basic income in the United States is the, we tend to be a more individualist society than collectivist society. So the collectivist societies, um, you know, dominantly European that have set up UBIs, 
uh, have a very different character than most of America, you know, which is fiercely individualistic. And I think that a lot, interestingly, I think a lot of the opposition for a universal basic income would actually come from those segments of society that actually might be its beneficiary. So in my native West Virginia, you know, nobody is more vulnerable uh, to being permanently outside of the economic mainstream and sort of working class West Virginians, yet they will vote against their economic interests because the perception will be uh, that somebody else will be taking advantage, that it will be unfair. And these are the people who are going to be voting against their economic interests when they vote for Donald Trump. Let me, let me ask, let me take the liberty as the, the moderator to ask one uh, final question before we wrap up, which is, uh, there's a lot I want to ask you about, you know, from cryptocurrencies to urbanization and so forth, but I want to ask you a question about the one topic that um, is heavily pronounced in your book that we haven't discussed yet, which is the last chapter, which is called The Most Important Job You'll Ever Have, The Future of Parenting. Um, and what's interesting about, you know, I said at the beginning that what makes this book so interesting is the methodology that Alec used to write it. I mean, he, he literally traveled around you know, asking you know, generals and admirals and presidents of countries and dissidents and you know, people from this country and that country, a geneticists, et cetera, all the same question about what makes a good parent in the future? What types of issues and challenges will a parent have to contend with in the future? So what does parenting look like in the future? Um, and what is like the wackiest, most sort of complex thing that we'll all have to deal with as a parent? Yeah, so first of all, I, should, I, I don't pretend to be a parenting guru in the book. Uh, my children would be, you know, the first point out I should not be pretending to be a parenting guru. Um, but what I did do is everybody who's really impressive who I, interviewed, who I interviewed for the book on their domain expertise, I put these questions about parenting to them. And there were a couple interesting points of consensus that emerged. Uh, the first is the importance of interdisciplinary learning. So people always say STEM, 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 STEM. And yes, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics are very important. But the indication that I got is that the people who will not just be employed in the future, but who will actually be leaders in the future, will be those who are able to combine levels of scientific or technological literacy uh, with aptitudes that we think of as being in the humanities, like behavioral psychology, economics, communications, and other such things. So being able to break down the silos between, say, computer science and political science, the people who really break down those barriers, as you've done in your career, Jared, um, are, are really going to be the leaders of the are really going to be um, uh, important leaders of the future. The second thing that I would say is sort of the anti for tomorrow is is in many respects I think going to be languages, uh, computer languages and foreign languages. Absent are having the device in our ear that understands everything that everybody is telling us. You know I do think that good old getting good old fashioned ink stamps in your passport is going to be increasingly necessary um, if you're going to be a leader in tomorrow's economy. You've got, you know, as our, as our economy grows more interconnected, uh, people who are willing and able to move around to frontier economies and be a part of the growth of, say, Papua New Guinea in the same way in which people were a part of the growth of China beginning 15 years ago, that's really where a lot of the great fortunes will be made. You know, what are the, the craziest challenges? I think, I think a lot of it goes to privacy. Um, you know, I am one of those people who I believe that privacy as we traditionally know it is gone and not coming back. Um, you know, today, March of 2016, we live in a world of about 16 billion internet connected devices. By 2020, that's gonna be 40 billion. Right, so in a world of 40 billion internet connected devices, which will probably be connected creating about 20 zettabytes of data uh, every year. You know, the kind of transparency, not from surveillance so much as from surveillance, I think is gonna, is gonna create a digital profile for everybody. Um, and I think that the real norm shifting is that everybody's gonna have a scandal. Um, you know, and I think that in a world where we, where all of our lives are consistently documented, I think that the norms that are going to shift, I think, is we're going to increasingly accept human fallibility. Uh, you know, the kinds of things that, 
you know, JFK did, you know, would never, we know today, never, would never remain private, would never remain secret. Uh, but as, as more of our lives become less secret, instead of our sort of summarily condemning more and more people, I think we're going to grow more and more accepting. You know, I think about drug use in the presidency, for example. You know, in 1992, it was like a legitimate political issue. Did Bill Clinton pale? You know, did he take a drag on a joint? And this was a, like a question of, if he inhaled, is he fit to be president? Fast forward 16 years, Barack Obama's running for president. He's like, oh, I inhaled. I inhaled a lot, and I liked it. And oh, by the way, I did coke. Non-issue. Think about homosexuality. I mean, when I was in college 20-some years ago, homosexuality was still this thing that was considered you know, aberrant and, you know, almost scandalous. There's the gay guy. Whereas on university campuses today, we accept. There's a fairly significant percentage of everybody who's gonna be homosexual, right? What happened? Norms shifted. And so I really think that the big change is gonna be, like for example, with my kids, nine, 11, and 13 years old, as they grow older in a world with so much more transparency, and so much digital documentation, I think that there is going to be less privacy of the type that we now know it. And as a result of that, we are going to increasingly accept human fallibility. Well, Alec, you've written a brilliant book. I'm also impressed that Papua New Guinea got three shout outs in the span of an hour that's more than probably the aggregate throughout history. Um, you know, you've really, this book's exceptional. And you know, even, you know, I think, you know, even more than the ambition of the, the project and the breadth of interviews and places that you went to write this, the, the, this book is your masterful translation of very complex topics uh, to audiences that will find it interesting from the most technical to the least technical. You've written a truly accessible book and a brilliant book. It's called Industries of the Future. Uh, you all have free copies. Go buy some for your friends. Alec Ross, thank you very much. Thank you.